and, uh, and I feel like it's something that the Lord wants us to, to really embrace and really get a grasp on. And so I'm not going to dazzle you uh, with theology or anything like that. Not that I ever have, but um, certainly I'm not going to do that today. Um, but I want to share with you a, a very important thought here entitled, You Can't Have My Praise. You Can't Have My Praise. How many knows that the devil is out to steal your praise? Man, and he'll do it any way he can. Won't he? Sure. When we were pulling out of Florida, we were 20 minutes from the house. And we were literally just getting on the, on the road. We loaded up. I flew in, got in there at 4.30 on Monday night. Had to wait until Sierra got off of work. And so it was about 8 o'clock when she got to the airport to pick me up. We drove back. We got up the next morning. We were there at 8.15 when they opened up. We got the truck and the trailer. We got back to the house. We loaded up the truck and trailer by about 11 o'clock. We went to Walmart to get us some groceries so we could eat along the way and try to be frugal, you know, trying to prepare ourselves. We get in the, in the van, and as we're taking off and, and going down the road, we got about 20 minutes outside uh, from where she lives, and I noticed that the transmission started slipping on that, on that van. And so I actually called the guy on the phone, and the guy says, oh, well, you'll have to call roadside assistance. And I, I, so I told Sarah, I said, well, let's just see what it does. Well, we get down just a few miles more down the road, and as I was slowing down to make the turn to get on Highway 50 to get out to the main interstate, um, the ABS light, brake light comes on the dash, and all of a sudden it wouldn't accelerate. It wouldn't do anything. Well, we just happened to be still on the outskirts of town, and Big Lots was right there. And everyone said, thank the Lord. Yeah. Amen for Big Lots, because I pulled in. I, oh, listen, they're my new best friend now, because they were parking lot was there when I needed them. So we pulled in there, and it wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't go frontward, it wouldn't go backwards. So we called. By the time they got us, they towed us. We had to take the car off the dolly. They towed us an hour and a half north to Ocala. We get there four and a half hours later. And two trucks later, because the second one they gave us, the air conditioner wouldn't work. And believe me when I tell you, we needed the air conditioner. And so by the time we got done and got on the road, it was four and a half hours later. And believe me when I tell you that it could have been very easy to have my praise taken away from me at that moment. Amen. Because I don't know about you, but I'm not real patient, real tolerant when it comes to mechanical issues. Because I know enough mechanical stuff to basically get me in trouble. Not that I can fix anything, not that I am overly proficient, but I know just enough that it, to know when I can't do something to fix something. And so here we are, and we're broke down, and, and we're way behind schedule now, and we've got a long ways to go. We've literally just started. And so I had to take a step back and say, thank the Lord we were not on the main highway when this happened. Thank the Lord there was a parking lot that was right there. Thank the Lord that we was at just still in town and we were close enough for them to come and get us. We could have certainly been somewhere where it would have been much more difficult for them to reach. At the same time, we didn't know about all the storms. We didn't know about all the things that was going on up ahead of us. Amen? But how many knows that God does? And how many knows that God cares about you? Amen? And so if that means breaking the car down, Amen. To delay you long enough to avoid something that is ahead of you. That's something to be thankful for, isn't it? And so even in this trip, we found ourselves in situations where we just simply had to say, you know what? Thank the Lord he's still looking out for us. We don't know what is ahead of us. And perhaps just those delays were just enough to prevent us from getting into something much more difficult. Well, this morning I want us to go into Nehemiah, one of my most favorite books in the whole world, along with one of the other ladies sitting in the church. Uh, my sister Mary absolutely loves the book of Nehemiah. And her and I have talked over the last couple of years a lot about this. And I told her, I'm going to your favorite book today. And I felt like this morning that this was a great description of, of how the enemy operates to try and take your praise away from you. Amen? Uh, listen, we've got to learn that praising God is, has to be of the utmost importance and the, absolutely the utmost um, uh, part of our activity. I think it's later on, but, but I, I want to read it right now. 
The Bible says in Psalms 146 and 2, don't worry about going there, Dustin. Um, 146 and 2, while I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have my being. As long as I live, I'm going to praise him. How, how many is determined that way? That we've got to be determined along these lines when we start talking about our lives and, and how we need to acknowledge God in everything that we do. Don't you agree? Come on now, y'all are going to have to help me this morning, all right? Nehemiah, we find the epitome of this happening, okay? And, and I want us just to take a few moments and, and read this story here in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. And I know that we'll be able, you'll be able to follow, follow along. And what I've done is I've put this in the World English Bible version because I wanted it to be really, really simple to us um, and really, really plain as we read it. But it happened that when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. He spoke before his brothers and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they re revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish, seeing that they are burned? Now Tobiah the Amorite was with him, and he said, Even that which they are building, if a fox go up, he shall break down their stone wall. Hear, our God, for we are despised, and turn back their reproach on their own head, and give them up for a spoil in a land of captivity, and don't cover their iniquity, and don't let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half the height of it, for the people had a mind to work. I want everybody to repeat that last line. For the people had a mind to work. Everybody say that with me. For the people had a mind to work. And we're going to come back to that here in just a, in just a minute. But it happened that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians, the Amorites and the, the Shodadites uh, heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem went forward and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very angry, and they conspired all of them together to come in the fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion therein. But we made our prayer to God and set against them day and night, and set a watch against them day and night because of them. And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of the burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so that they are not able to build the wall. How many knows that sometimes you've got to you got to clean the rubbish out of the way, don't you? If you're going to build anything, every once in a while you got to stop and move the junk out of the way. Our adversaries said, They shall not know, neither see, until we come into the midst of them and kill them and cause the work to cease. It happened that when the Jews who lived by them came, they said to us ten times from all places, You must return to us. Therefore, said I, in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in the open places, I set there the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. I looked and rose up and said to the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Don't be, don't be you afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and God had brought their counsel to nothing that we returned all of us to the wall, everyone to his work. It happened from that time forth that half of my servants worked the work, half of them held the spears, the shields, and the bows, and the coats of mail, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They built the wall, and those who bore burdens loaded themselves. Everyone, everyone with one of his hands worked in the work, and with the other held his weapon. And the builders, everyone had his sword girded by his side, and so built. He who sounded the trumpet was by me. And I said to the nobles, and to the rulers, and to the rest of the people, The work is great and large, and we are separated on the wall, one far from another. In whatever place you hear the sound of the trumpet, resort you there to us. Our God will fight for us. So we worked in the work, and half of them held the spirits from the rising of the morning until the stars appeared. Likewise, at the same time, said I to the people, Let everyone with his servant lodge within Jerusalem, 
that in the night they may be a guard to us and may labor in the day. So neither I nor my brothers nor servants nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us put off our clothes. Everyone went with his weapon to the water. That's a lot of scripture. I know it's a lot of scripture, but it's an extremely important story when we consider the subject matter of what we're talking about here today. Many of the work has been looked upon with contempt by proud and haughty scorners. There's always going to be those that when God is doing something good, there will always be those who try to tear it down and undermine what God is doing. Amen? The moment God starts to bless you, there will always be those that will be naysayers and always be those who want to tear down what God is trying to exalt. Those who disagree in almost everything Will, will unite in persecution. Isn't it funny how birds of a feather flock together? Amen? Isn't it amazing that those who complain and can always find fault always have company with them? Amen? Those who see the negative always will gravitate towards the negative. Because when a negative person gets around a positive person, that negative person can't stand it. Amen? Because the positive person is always speaking positive. Amen. And though that negative person <coughs> is speaking negative, they can't overcome the positive nature of those who are in Christ Jesus. Did you catch that? Even though they're speaking negative, that negative person cannot overcome the positive nature of a child of God. A positive nature of a child of God. Did you catch that? That means if you're a child of God, you should be positive. Amen. Amen. That means when you get a blowout going down the road and you're going to be delayed another two hours, you've got to find some positive in it somewhere. Amen. You gave me the opportunity to eat the last Cinnabon. Woo! I don't know. That don't excite you, but it excited me. I can tell you that it gave me the opportunity to enjoy that Cinnabon without trying to do it as I was driving. Amen. You have to find the positive sometimes in things. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes you've got to look pretty hard. Amen. Sometimes you have to look hard. Nehemiah did not answer these fools according to their folly, but looked up to God by prayer. Rather than answer those who were being negative, he turned his attention to the Lord. And if we would spend more time doing that rather than answering our naysayers, you would be surprised at how positive you would find things. Amen. God's people have often been despised people, but here, but he hears all the slights that are put upon them. Just because I don't ever want you to think that you're the only one that is hearing the negative. God hears every bit of it. Amen. And he takes exception to his children being mocked. He takes exception to his children being scorned. Certainly he does, amen? Well, do, do you, when your children are being scorned? Do you take exception to that? Come on, parents. Do you take exception when somebody makes fun of your child? Amen. When somebody mocks your child in some way, when somebody says something negative about your children, it don't make any difference how old your children are. My children are in their 20s. And somebody says something negative to that, I take exception to it. Amen. Because I'm their father and I'm looking out for them. Amen. And the father that is in heaven is doing the exact same thing for you. He takes exception when people say negative things about you and the things that you are doing. Nehemiah had reason to think that the hearts of those sinners were desperately hardened, else he would not have prayed that their sins might never be blotted out. Good work goes on well when people have a mind to do it. The reproaches of enemies should quicken us to our duty, not drive us from it. If you're being driven away from your duty because people are trying to hinder you or saying negative things about you or negative things about what you're doing, and that detours you from doing what you're called to do, or it detours you from doing the things that God wants you to do, then you need to take a step back and reconsider that calling. You need to take a step back and reconsider the convictions that you truly have in the Lord. Because when pressure is applied, that's when people are truly seen for who they are. Don't you agree? We made our prayer, nevertheless, um, 
Nehemiah said, we made our prayer to God and we set a watch against them day and night because of them. Nehemiah and the Jews with him were rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Sanballat and others were, red, were angry with them and tried to stop the work. They determined to pounce upon the people all of a sudden and slay them. They didn't, they didn't want it to be an open rebellion. They didn't want it to be an open onslaught. They wanted to do it in secret. And how many knows that's how the devil likes to work? He likes to work from secret places. He likes to work from behind the scenes. He likes to undermine and do the things because then it catches us off guard and it catches us all of a sudden and usually when people are caught off guard and, and, and usually when they're, when they're thrust upon suddenly they make bad decisions and they make bad choices. Wouldn't you agree? If I have plans to prepare and I know that something is coming and I can prepare John for whatever that thing is coming up, I can prepare even if I know that there are going to be some difficult times in that, then I can overcome those and I can prepare myself for the difficult times. But when it's thrust upon me suddenly, I have to make a quick decision. Amen? And we can see how that can be difficult at times. And if we're not careful, we can make the wrong choice and we can make the wrong decision. Our text tells us what Nehemiah and his companions did in this emergency. In this emergency, they didn't respond to Sanballat and Tobiah. They didn't respond to the, to, the, to the armies that were coming against them. But they said, we made our prayer unto God and set watch against them day and night because of them. These people had not only to build the wall of Jerusalem, but they had to watch their enemies at the same time. This case is ours as well. We have to work for Christ. We have to work for Christ. Amen. I hope that all of us who love him are trying to do what we can to build his kingdom. Because it's a body ministry, folks. Amen. It's not, it's not a ministry just for one or two, but everybody has their proper place. But, we, but along with the work, we need to be watchful. Because the enemy is out to destroy us. And he's out to stop us. Amen. The scripture tells us in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, we're not, we're not ignorant of his devices. Lest Satan should get the larger portion of us, because, but we're not ignorant to his devices. So what we have to do is we have to guard ourselves to make sure that he doesn't get that. If we're not ignorant to his devices, how many knows that the enemy is always looking to find a way to stop you. He's always going to do that. Listen, he's tried everything under the sun to stop what we're trying to do in this local church. Amen? Everything. And he continues to do that. But Sister Solomon, we're not ignorant of those devices. We know that's what the devil is going to do. And we have to be aware of that. Amen? We have to constantly be vigilant and watchful because our adversary is looking to destroy us. He is looking to stop what God is wanting to do in our hearts and in our lives. But it's up to us what we choose to do, how we choose to respond. Nehemiah gives us the example, and that is to call upon the name of the Lord. Because if we will turn to God, He will strengthen us, He will protect us, and He will do the things necessary for us to succeed. I believe that there are three elements of this story that I find relevant to our task today. The first thing I want us to look at this morning is that the people had a mind to work. They had a mind to work. A mind to work is not a mind to watch Jim work. <laughs> Amen. That, that's not how it worked. Now, Sierra, as we were traveling, she, she was watching that drive for 3,000 miles. And it wasn't until we were just outside of Pendleton that she said, Dad, you want me to drive? And, and, and I, was, I was like, no, honey, I'm all right. We've made it this far. I'm good to go. Okay. At that point, we drove 18 hours on the last day to get to the Tri Cities, and and I will tell you, I, at that point, I was it was very difficult. But thank the Lord, I happened to look at my GPS when we stopped in Pendleton. I looked at my GPS and I found a back road, and I found an old a, an old highway, a farm highway that came over the mountain from Pendleton right into Hermiston, just north of Hermiston, or west, east of Hermiston. And it dropped us right down, and, I, and it probably, we figured it cut off an hour and a half 
of driving to go all the way down into Hermiston and, and to come all the way around through Kennewick and, and make that big loop to go right back to somewhere that by going over that mountainside and, and that mountain road, we were able to drop right in 30 minutes from the house where we were going to stay. And I am telling you, I was so grateful for it. But I would never been on this road. And when we got on this road, the very first thing Sierra said, now you have to realize it is probably midnight now. We've been on the road since 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm trying to think where we were at. Wyoming time. Okay, and so we've been traveling a long time. We're tired. The cats are meowing. <laughs> They're done. They want out of their cages. They, they, I'm telling you, we had reached the end of our road. And when we got there, and when we started on this two-lane road, windy road, going through the farmland and the wheat fields and everything, and I've never been on it, and needless to say, there's no lights out there, and, and it's dark, and it's, some, of the, some of the road was real high up, no guardrails, two-lane road. I mean, it, it was a little sketchy, I can tell you. And Sierra said to me, she said, every Chainsaw Massacre movie has started with somebody driving down one of these roads. And I was like, I don't need to hear that at midnight. Because if we break down, that means I have to walk up to some farmhouse out in the middle of nowhere and ask for help. Y'all get the picture? Okay, that's not really what I wanted to do. And so as we came over this mountain and it dropped down, I'm telling you, I was so thankful. Because once we got down on 7, I think the, the highway is 737, which is right there going in the back way like you're going to Walla Walla, I knew where I was at. At that point, I dropped on that highway, and Nate, I could have closed my eyes and pointed the Pinsky truck in that direction, and it would have known where to go. I was home free at this point. I had grown up in this area. Man, let me tell you, I knew the I could have I could have done this by braille at this point. I was I was home free at this point. Okay? But it took me going through a time where I had to just depend on that GPS. I had to trust that the map was legitimate. I had to trust that there were certain things I didn't understand, but I had to trust that somebody had gone before me. Are you getting the picture of what I'm trying to tell you here today? Nehemiah had some inspiration from the Lord to rebuild this wall and how important it was. In the process of that, there was no way that the devil would allow it. And so he sent two men to undermine what he was doing. And very seldom are you going to have the attempt of the enemy to just send somebody in here and send a gunman in here and it's just going to kill everybody in the room. That usually doesn't happen. Do you hear me? But what he will do is he will get people to doubt sitting in the congregation. He will get people to bicker with one another and disagree with one another. And what he does is he's causing fracture, or factions and fractions inside of that congregation. And that's how he undermines and stops the work of God. Seldom do you see a church just split because... You know, because of some major catastrophe, usually they split over frivolous things. Amen. Don't like the color of the paint. They don't like the music that's being played. They don't like the instruments that they're using. They don't like the carpet. They don't like the chairs. They don't like this. They don't like that. And what you get is you get people that are disagreeing, and then they become disagreeable. Amen. They become disagreeable, and no longer can they unite together. And that's what I, we, we have to see here. But when people get a mind to work, we can accomplish anything. Everybody say amen. amen. The, original, the original language in this, in, in, in Hebrew, in the original, it's very emphatic. For the people had a heart to work. And we have a slide for that, Dustin. For the people, number one, for the people had a mind to work. The original is very emphatic. For the people had a heart to work. Remember we talked about where the beginning of the fight always starts at? Where does the fight take place first and foremost? Somebody tell me. Huh? It's in the mind, right? As, as the mind goes, so goes the body. Amen. When I move this arm around, it's because my brain's telling it to do so, and my arm is obeying the brain. Amen? We know how paralysis operates. Paralysis... When paralysis takes place, it's something that stops the communication between a limb and the brain. Amen? 
whether it's, a, whether it's a severed nerve or whatever the case may be, there is something that blocks the communication between the limb and the brain. When you and I get distracted and we allow any obstacle to hinder, hear me now, hinder our communication, the communication between us and God, it paralyzes us and prevents us from doing the work of the Lord. Amen. It's as simple as anything stopping our communication. It doesn't have to be catastrophic. It could simply be busyness. You hear me? We can become so busy working for the Lord that we forget about the Lord. But you don't think that's true? Go over and read in Revelation chapter 2 about the church at Ephesus. He said, I, I see all the great things that you're doing, but here's the problem. You've forgotten why you did it. You've forgotten to keep your relationship strong with me. And because of that, he said, you've left your love. You've left your first love. The communication between the church at Ephesus and God had dissipated. And they had become proficient at doing the work of the Lord. Amen. When the communication breaks down, this is when trouble starts. The people had a heart to work. It's important for the mind to say, we know what needs to be done. But if we have not made a deliberate, and this is what Mary and I were talking about last night. When we do not make a deliberate choice to allow God to speak his life into us, and it becomes part of who we are, then we're still trying to operate out of our intellect. Amen. But when it becomes part of who you are, that becomes part of your DNA. You don't have to think about doing the things of God. You simply do them. The, the people here had a heart for the work. Their hearts were engaged in it. Everyone say engaged. And when the heart is engaged, the work goes on well. Amen? Listen, if you have to force yourself to pray, there's a communication issue. If you have to force yourself to get up and come to church, there's a communication problem. Amen. You're still serving God out of your intellect, not out of your heart. Amen. Going to the house of God is, should never be laborsome. It should never be something that you debate. Do I go? Do I not go? Oh, I'm really tired. Oh, i got this to do tomorrow. Going to the house of God should be something that never... Ray, it never becomes a thought process. It's something that we do because we love to do it. We love to be in the presence of the Lord. We love to be with our brothers and sisters. Why? Because iron sharpens iron. Amen? If you wasn't here this morning, you would have got to hear that God, listen, don't pass this off as being irrelevant. This healing that, that Nate has experienced is, was a serious healing. Amen? Anybody ever have back problems? When was the day I didn't? I've had them for so long, I don't know. I wouldn't know a day. I don't have a memory of not having back issues. So for God to heal him, that's enormous. And that's something only our God can do. You hear me? That's something only our God can do. Rather than be hindered because... God knows what he has need of when it comes to Nate and where God is going to lead him and what God is going to have him do. God knows what he has need of. Amen? And God sees the necessity at this point and at this time to heal his body. Amen? When your heart is engaged, the work of God goes well. And then we go back to that scripture in Psalms 146 and 2. While I live, while I praise the Lord, I will sing praises unto my God while I have my being. For the kingdom of God to be explained or expanded, there must be a mindset of deliberate action. Let me say that again. For the kingdom of God to be expanded, there must be a mindset of deliberate action. Did you catch that? Deliberate action. The kingdom of God is not going to grow simply because we will it to be so. Amen. This local church, it's not going to grow simply because we will it to be or we wish it to be full. But it's going to be because of a deliberate action on our part. 
Planning, preparation, vision casting are all part of the initial process when it comes to church expansion. But without a deliberate act, these produce no fruit. We can have all the meetings in the world, but if we can't trans translate that, that act of instruction to action outside the four walls, then all we're doing is meeting and talking about the good things that will come eventually. The enemy of our soul expresses to us the cares of this life and the obstacles to distract us from the overall mission of the gospel. Just like with Nehemiah, when the reports came that the rubbish had piled up to the extent of hindering the process of building the wall. Just like rubbish built up during construction. Those of you that was around here when we were doing construction. Jim, there was rubbish everywhere, wasn't there? And then we had to stop periodically and clean it all out. Amen. Because if not, there's dangers, all kinds of hidden dangers that are under stepping on a nail, tripping over a cord, tripping over a wire, tripping over a piece of wood. There's all kinds of things that can happen on a construction site. And so even when I was doing commercial construction, there was always a crew that was out of the laborers' union that all they did was go around and clean up. That's all they did. They swept up, they cleaned up, they picked up, they carried out. They kept all of the rubbish out of the way. Because for a guy that was walking on stilts, The smallest of screws, the smallest of screws, if I stepped on that screw on a concrete floor and I stepped on that screw with the heel of that stilt, it was an ice skating rink. And I don't know about you, I mean you can stand up on a chair and fall down and see how it feels, don't do that. But I can tell you standing on stilts and falling from that height and you have four feet of steel that's connected to your leg that you just can't take a step like you normally would. That's the weirdest feeling, Brother Solomon, when you're up on stilts and you're falling. And in your mind, your brain is telling you to do the things that you would if you didn't have stilts on. And the moment you try to do those things and you have three or four feet of steel that is connected to the bottom of your feet, and all of a sudden you're hindered from being able to do the things to protect you from falling, you just have to fall and hit the ground and hope for the best. And believe me, I've done it. I've been there. And, and there is nothing that makes a, a guy that walks stilts more angry than those little screws being left on the floor, or what's even worse are those colored wire nets. Because you can go into a, in a dark room and you don't see those little plastic wire nets. Boy, I'm telling you, they could mess your world up in a second. So it's important. And I learned after being in the trade for, for a few years that, Ray, you went in and you, you looked at the area that you were going to work in. You made sure that there was no wire nets or wire. Or there, there was no obstacles that could trip you and cause you to fall on those stilts. Amen. Every once in a while, we have to stop and take inventory of the rubbish that is being built up even in our own lives. Don't you agree? Because if we don't get the rubbish out of our lives, we don't get the things that surround us that can potentially hinder us and cause us harm. If we don't get those things eliminated from our life, then sure enough, there is danger that is ahead of us. And the truth of it is, it can cost us our entire soul. The enemy of our soul expresses to us the cares of this life. Always reminded us of the facts, as Sister Rhonda said. And the obstacles that distract us from the overall mission of the gospel. Just like with Nehemiah, when the reports came that the rubbish had piled up, uh, to the extent of hindering the progress of building the wall, they had to stop and they had to take notice and they had to eliminate the rubbish that they could, and at the very least they had to put watchmen where the rubbish was at. When God's people have a mind to do the will of the Lord, there is nothing too great for them to accomplish. Twelve men turned the world upside down. The Apostle Paul impacted the known world to the extent of planting churches everywhere he went. Entire islands were won to the Lord, won to the kingdom of God because he had a mind to do the will of God. Even after a shipwreck, he still had a mind to do the will of the Lord. Even after being thrust into the innermost parts of the prison, he still had a mind to do the will of the Lord. You and I have got to get it in our minds 
and, in our, and not just in our minds, but in our hearts and in our spirit, that if we are going to expand the kingdom of God, we have got to have a mind to do God's will in all things. Amen. Secondly, we take the thought from verse 9. But we made our prayer to God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. The Bible tells us in Psalms 34 and 1. And I, and I left this in here purposely because I thought the description was very applicable. Notice in the description, it is a psalm of David when he changed his behavior. Amen. If you are going to be effective in the kingdom of God and in the furtherance of the kingdom, not only must you be prayerful, not only must you be watchful, but that means you must change your behavior. Amen. Now, how many knows you can't do that? You can't change your own character. But that's the point of being prayerful and watchful. Because grace is what? God doing in us the things that we cannot do for ourselves. Amen? So as we consider this, David, the psalm of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, he drove him away and he departed. And what did David say when he changed his behavior? You know what? how he got to a place that he could change his behavior? He repented. You hear me? He repented and he surrendered himself to the Lord. John, that's how we change our behavior. We change our behavior by submitting to God and allowing him to do the things necessary in us. Why? Because we can't change ourselves. We try, but what happens when the pressure comes? When the pressure comes, we always revert back to who we really are. Amen? But when we repent and when we surrender wholly over to the Lord, then we can say, as David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. The setting of the watch was a work that was appointed. Understand, Nehemiah deliberately put a watch in certain places. We set a watch, he says. Nehemiah didn't say, now some of you fellows, go and watch. He didn't, he didn't say, anybody feel like being a watchman? Right? Anybody feel like being a security guard? He didn't do that. He set watchmen. It was a deliberate, I don't want to say deliberate. It was a deliberate action. Amen? Leaving the post, or he, he didn't say, some of you go and watch, leaving the post of the watchman open to any who chose to take it, but they set a watch. A certain number of men had to go on duty at a certain point, at a certain hour, and remain for a certain length of time, and be on guard against the adversary. We set a watch, he said. If we are able to watch over ourselves, we must do so. We must do it with a definite purpose. We must say, I must try to be watchful. Is that deliberate? I must try? That's not deliberate, is it? When you say, well, I'll do the best I can, that's leaving it open to interpretation, right? Because your definition of the best you can, okay, let's just, let's just bring it down where we all live. You remember when your kids started first mowing the grass? Started first mowing the lawn? Right? Or, they, or moms, your daughters started cleaning the house, doing the dishes, doing whatever, vacuuming. They, their best intentions, okay, their interpretation of their best may have been different from your interpretation of the best. Amen? When it came to mowing the grass at my house, Brother Solomon, it wasn't left for interpretation. We did it the way Dad said to do it. Dad said to do it this particular way. Why? It was his law. You hear me? His law, his way. Amen. So you can't go to God and say, well, I'll just do the best I can because it's not open for interpretation. Amen. God wants us to be deliberate. When he says watch, that's what he expects you to do. Watch. Be, be fervent in your watching. Okay. Be deliberate in your actions when it comes to serving the Lord. Don't just do the best you can. That leaves it open for failure. Amen. Listen, if you study to show yourself approved, if you will do that and deliberately do that, then you don't have to worry, well, I hope I make heaven. People that hope they make heaven most likely won't. 
Okay. I'll just leave me out there on a limb. I'll hold on. This was a deliberate act. We must be watchful. Your watchfulness must, must be a distinct and definite act as well as prayer. Prayer cannot be something that you try to do. Prayer must be something that you do without ceasing. Jay, amen? When I was in, in the service, we each pulled guard duty. It was a set time, set location, and we each carried a distinct responsibility. Guard duty would seem to be nothing more than walking around and staying awake. When you think about a security guard, we've all seen security guards at the mall. And we look at that and say, not too challenging. Okay? But when the fire comes, when the difficulties come, their responsibilities are great, aren't they? When I was in the service, I'm sweating in my, my sleep. It won't stay where it needs to be. When I was in the service, guard duty was serious. Guard duty, pulling guard duty at nighttime on the main door was the most terrifying job that we had in the service. Because inevitably, the drill sergeants came in the middle of the night, beat on the door, and wanted in to their, into their, their dorm. Well, you couldn't just open the door, even though we knew them. We were trained that you didn't open the door. You don't open the door unless they give you the proper identification and the proper code. Now, pro part of that proper identification was an ID card. On that ID card, it had a picture of who they are, it had their rank, okay? it had their name, it had their signature. You would be surprised at how many kids panicked and opened the door that had a picture of Mickey Mouse on there. <laughs> Terrified. Because here's this big drill instruction that you're already scared of, and they're beating on the door screaming and telling you to open up the door or he'll rip your throat out. And you're terrified and you're panicked. And so you ask him for ID, and he throws up an ID, and it's an idea of an ID of you know Richard Nixon. You know, or it has his picture, but it has somebody else's name. You understand what I'm saying? You had to follow the process down to the very last detail. Because if you didn't follow it the proper way, in real life, it could be the difference between your entire group dying or living. Now we had one kid, there was a story there um, of our particular drill instructor. We had a sister flight that was a group of, of, of airmen that was next to us. And they had a world-class bodybuilder as a drill instructor. He was about six foot five, and when he walked up to the door, all you saw was chest. <laughs> Literally, he was so, he had to get down like this to look through the window. He was a massive human being. Well, he came in late at night. He wanted in this dorm. He gave the, he gave the airman the proper identification, and the airman panicked and wouldn't let him in. And he said, airman, I want you to take a close look at my ID. Notice it's my picture, it's my signature, it's my rank, it's my name. I want you to open the door. And the airman was scared and he thought he was doing something wrong. He thought he was being tricked. And his brain could not connect the dots. And so he panicked and wouldn't let him in. Well now the drill instructor becomes enraged and he's beating on the door threatening this airman, telling him you better open up this door. And it goes on and on and on. Well this goes on for several minutes. And the airman would not open up the door. He, was, he had panicked, he was scared, he, and he could not make the connection. He would not let him in. And so the drill instructor tore the door off the hinges. Now these doors, these doors are not just solid doors, but these are solid military doors. These doors are weigh a couple hundred pounds. He ripped it completely off the hinges, out of its, out of its block, and set it off to the side grabbed the hold of the airman and held the ID and told him to read the ID and then the airman finally figured out, oh, I should have let him in. Now needless to say, when you get to pull guard duty, those stories run through your mind. And even though I was considered an old man when I went in, it's still a very unnerving position to be in because the responsibility of those 60 men that are in that room are your responsibility. 
A watchman has a tremendous responsibility. Guard duty would seem to be like nothing more than walking around and staying awake. But the sentry carries a great responsibility. He is there to alert those sleeping of impending danger. The watchman never slumbers nor sleeps. He is always on the ready to defend his post. Are you hearing me today? 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong. Colossians 4 and 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. It was a work carefully done. Not just deliberately done, but carefully done. We set a watch against them day and night because of them. Those three last words would be better rendered over against them. That is, wherever there was an enemy, we set a watch there. They are likely to come up this way. Very well, put a watch there. Perhaps they may shift about and come up this other way. Nehemiah said, that's fine. Put a watch over there. Possibly, they would say, they'll come by climbing up the wall uh, in front over here. And he said, that's fine. Set a watch there. Nehemiah was deliberate and careful about where he set his watches because the enemy could come in at any place. How about this? One brother in the church has a very hot temper. So set a watch there. Another is depressed and won't leave his house. Well, that's fine. Set a watch there. Why are we setting watches? Because the enemy is coming to destroy. Are you catching that? One friend has a tendency for pride, another to unbelief. So the Bible instructs us to set a watch wherever the foe is likely to come. We made our prayer unto God and set a watch over against them. It was a work that never ceased. Once they started putting watchmen in place, it did not cease until the building of the wall was complete. We set a watch against them day and night. There was people that went 24 hours a day on watch, or 12-hour shifts, in 12-hour shifts. Of course, if Sanballat had told them, um, told him when he meant to attack them, they might have gone to sleep at all the other times. But as he did not give them that information, they had to set a watch day and night. The devil will not give you notice when he's going to tempt you. He likes to take men by surprise. Therefore, we're instructed to set a watch day and night. We must be on guard. Don't you agree? We must be on guard. And finally this morning, let me quickly conclude it with this. Number three, we must be united in purpose, in spirit, and in deed. We must be united. We must be united in purpose, in spirit, and in deed. The scripture tells us the work is great and large, and we are uh, separated on the wall one far from another. In whatever place you hear the sound of the trumpet, resort there to us, our God will fight for us. So we worked in the work, and half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning until the stars appeared. Likewise, at the same time, said I to the people, let everyone with his servant lodge within Jerusalem, that in the night they may be a guard to us and may labor in the day. So neither I, nor my brothers, nor servants, nor the men, the guard who followed me, none of us put off our clothes. Everyone went with his weapon to the water. Did you catch that? Even when they went to the water to wash up, they kept their weapon with them. In the military, in the military, when you're given a weapon, that's your weapon. It don't belong to anybody else, and you don't give your weapon to anybody else. You don't give them your weapon, and you don't leave your weapon behind. You go to the bathroom, you take your weapon with you. You go to the mess hall, you take your weapon with you. You hear me? It don't matter what you're doing, your weapon is your best friend. Amen? You take care of your weapon. You're taught to take care of your weapon. You're taught to clean your weapon. Amen? You, 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 you talk to your weapon. You sleep with your weapon. Your weapon is your best friend. It will be the difference between you living and you dying when you're in a combat situation. Your weapon is what protects you. 
Folks, why is it that we become so comfortable that we don't take our Bibles everywhere we go? I don't know about you, but when I worked, I took the Bible with me to work. Amen. And, and I don't know if I still have, when I had my other truck, I kept a Bible in my truck. Because you never know when you're going to need the Word of God. Amen? I don't know about you, but I can't quote the whole thing. Amen? When I went on the road with Sierra to go down and pick Sierra up, I had my iPad, the one that I'm preaching from, so I had stuff, I had my Bible in there, I had it on my phone. I don't ever want to be without my weapon. Do you hear me? Why? Because in the time that you least expect it, Amen. This is when the enemy is going to attack you. And how do you overcome the enemy? By the blood of the Lamb, by the word of your testimony. The word of your testimony. But for you to overcome the enemy, you have to overcome him not with your intellect. Amen. What got him in trouble? Having a conversation with the devil. That's what messed her up. But you remember when we talked about this, how did Jesus overcome the devil? It is written. Even Jesus, the Son of God, used the Word of God to fight against the devil. Are we any different? Are we any better? Certainly not. The weapon of our warfare is not carnal. Right? Mighty through God to the pulling down of strong. How do we do that? Through the Word of God. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, is it not? The Word of God is the very thing that when the heaven and earth passes away, everything else passes away, the Word will still be here. Amen. It is the very thing that we can trust and depend on in times of great difficulty, as well as in times of great peace. I've stated for two years now that this is a body ministry. It's not a pastor or a leadership ministry, but a body ministry. That means that each of us has a personal responsibility for the expansion of God's kingdom. The, the disciples could not function properly until they were united by the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. Let me give you an example. They argued over who would be greatest, who would sit at the Lord's right hand. They focused on things like storms and crowds and even food for Jesus. The whole time missing the bigger picture. Let me give you an example. Let me, I'll give you the scripture for it. They focused on the storms. They forgot about Jesus. How do we know this? Because the Bible tells us in Luke 8, 22, Now it came to pass a certain day that he went to the ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over to the other side. They forgot that when Jesus says, Let us, we're included with him. Amen? So when they got out onto the sea, what happened? Storm rose up, and they began to cry out. They had forgotten that Jesus said, Let us. Amen? In other words, if the ship wrecked, it would wreck with Jesus in it. Amen? If he says, let us go over to the other side, that's the most secure thing that he can tell us. Amen? If he says he'll never leave us nor forsake us, that's the most secure thing that we can hold on to in our lives. Is that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. What about this one? They focused on the crowds. Luke 9, Luke chapter 9, verse 10, and the apostles, when they were returned, told him that they, what they had done, and he took them, and he went aside privately into a desert place belonging to the city called Bethesda. And the people, when they knew it, followed him, and received them, and spake unto them the kingdom of God, and healed them that had need of healing. And when the day began to wear away, there then came the twelve and said unto him, Send the multitude away. They may go into the towns of the country round about and lodge and get victuals. For we are here in a desert place. But he said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And he said, We have no more but five loaves and two fishes, except we should uh, go and buy meat for all this people. For they were about five thousand men. And he said to his disciples, Make them sit down by fifties in a company. And they did so, and made them all sit down. Then took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and break, and gave to the disciples, and set before the multitude. And they did eat and were filled, and they were taken up from the fragments that remained to them, twelve baskets. When the, when the disciples were concerned about the crowds, Jesus was still able to see the bigger picture. Amen. What about this? They were concerned oftentimes with just the food. For the Bible tells us in John chapter 4, verse 28, the woman then left her water pot and went away into the city and said to the men, Come and see a man which told me all the things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? 
Then they went out of the city and came to him. And in the meanwhile, I love that. I love how John wrote that. In the meanwhile, in the meantime, and on to another part of this story. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed with him, saying, Master, eat. Missing the whole picture. Missing the whole point of even going through Samaria. All they could focus on was the fact that Jesus had to eat. But he said to them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Have any man brought him out to eat? Once again, they're still caught up in the food thing. Jesus is trying to speak to them about spiritual things, and they're, and they're still concerned about being hungry. Jesus said to them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. A deliberate act. Amen? Say not ye that there are four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes. And you've heard me preach this message. I believe Jim wholeheartedly when he said, lift up your eyes and look. He was pointing at the Samaritans that was coming out of Samaria, that was coming to hear the message of Jesus. I believe he was telling them, look, look. It's ripe and ready for harvest. Look. Stop paying attention to your belly. Stop worrying about the food. Stop looking at the... Thank you. Thought I was going to fall off. Stop looking at the facts. Right? Start paying attention to the truth. Jesus said stop paying attention to the facts that you're hungry and see the truth, the truth of why we are here. And that is to bring the message of hope to the Gentiles. Amen? Powerful thought. All these Things can rob you of your praise, rob you of your worship, rob you of your relationship with the Lord. But I'm here this morning to remind you to keep your praise. In spite of everything else, keep your praise. Finally, Luke chapter 9, verse 38, 19, verse 38, saying, Bless the king, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Or that they were excited now. They were hollering and screaming, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. And boy, then the righteous, the holy righteous people. The San Ballad and Tobias of the New Testament, the Pharisees from among the multitude said to them, Master, rebuke your disciples. Tell them to shut up. We're not wanting to hear it. Right? The negative people stepped out of the crowd. The positive people we're saying, blessed be the name of the Lord. Right? Blessed be the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And the negative, the sad ballad and Tobias stepped out and said, shut him up. We don't want to hear it. We're having a bad day. Don't you realize they just had a blowout? Don't you realize the transmission just went out? My Lord, I can't even get four miles down the road. You hear me? There's always going to be sand out and Tobias in your life. It's going to hinder you and try to hinder you from seeing what God is actually doing. There will always be those who try to rob you of your praise. There will always be those who threaten and declare you unworthy and unable. But we have found a formula to keep that praise this morning. First of all, have a mind to work for the kingdom of the Lord. Everyone say, I have a mind to work. Secondly, be prayerful and watchful, for the enemy lies in wait to steal your praise. Be prayerful and watchful. Amen? Be prayerful and watchful. Be watchful, but be prayerful. Amen? They go hand in hand. And number three, remember that this is a body ministry, and each of us carry a great responsibility. Young and old alike, we must work. We must watch. And we, and as we are united in purpose and in spirit, we will accomplish the task that is before us. But we have to be united. We can't do it any other way. Stand your feet.